Hello and welcome to Wanted, the live show where you can help solve crime. Tonight, thank you Australia, your calls have given police vital new leads and one dramatic breakthrough. Now we need your help again. This dangerous bank robber is on the run. Award-winning crime investigator Neil Mercer on the armed bandit wanted over 10 armed holdups. Get out. Former Detective Superintendent Terry Dalton on a brazen series of robberies with an unusual target. And the brutal murder of an 82-year-old woman has remained a mystery for more than four decades. Tonight, Wanted's forensic expert, Dr. Zanthi Malik, reveals some new clues that could finally help track down the killer. I just hope they catch the murder. Wanted is working in partnership with police around Australia to help solve crime. Crime Stoppers are standing by across the country, ready to take your calls. If you recognise a face or if there's anything in tonight's stories that jogs your memory, you could hold the vital lead that helps solve a case on Wanted. I'm Sandra Sully. In a moment, we'll look at how you responded to our appeals last week, the new leads and the breakthroughs after Wanted's premiere program, including a positive development regarding missing 14-year-old Bethany Neville. But we begin with the hunt for a man on the run in South Australia. Look closely at this gunman. If you recognise him, get onto Crime Stoppers. He's wanted in connection with at least 10 armed hold-ups. He's extremely dangerous and could be hiding anywhere in Australia tonight. Wanted's Neil Mercer takes up the story. It's not a movie. It's not a game. He is absolutely dangerous. We will hunt this person forever. It's Friday, June 27, 2008. The small town of Balaclava is quietly going about its day-to-day -day business. But that peace and quiet is about to be shattered. The customer came in the shop and said the ANZ's been held up with someone with a, a gun or a rifle. I saw the local uh, policeman, Steve, uh, sort of with his gun sort of drawn um, standing near the ANZ there, so I thought, well, shit, that's too good. It wasn't good at all. Inside the little a bandit, terrifying staff and two customers. Australia's named robber, dubbed the Bicycle or Hills Bandit, is striking for the ninth time. He is absolutely dumb. His actions have shown that. He's a man who's prepared to arrive at a bank, come armed and threaten people. There's no other way to describe him but dangerous. The weapon that he's brought to each and every bank is a, a SKK 7.62 calibre automatic weapon. Initially, the robber had a very unusual way of fleeing the scene. In the early four robberies that uh, were committed, he certainly left the scene on a bicycle. You know, the bikes were either taken with him or dumped. The bicycle bandit struck again at the Lobethal ANZ. This time, he escaped on a green bike, which he dumped before getting into a white 1990s Mitsubishi. In all, the bandit has robbed 10 small South Australian banks outside of Adelaide, from about 100 kilometres to the north to some 70 kilometres to the south. The most violent and confronting was on June 27, 2008, in the town of Balaclava, population about 1,500. This is what happened. Nobody move! A 
nearby police officer alerted to the robbery was quickly on the scene. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What happened inside the bank was, uh, once the demand was made on the officer, uh, the absolutely correct choice was made to uh, withdraw uh, outside. Uh, two reasons, one, to avoid a hostage situation, and two, no one wants uh, shots fired between offenders and police. We try to avoid that at all costs. These are pretty dramatic pictures. Yeah, it was a dramatic day. Andrew Manuel from the local paper, The Plains Producer, was there within minutes. And this, this fellow? Uh, Mark Van Cleef was directing traffic. Mark Van Cleef, the local butcher, has lived in Balaclava for 40 years. He ran up the street and directed people away from the bank. Oh, I don't think he was brave. I think he was just caring for your community and just doing the, you know, the right thing. At this early stage, no one knew where the bandit was. Balaclava went into lockdown. Um, we were told to lock the doors and stay away from the windows because he was actually carrying a gun himself. What started as a quiet, normal day for hairdresser Nicole Gregory quickly turned to high drama. We had um, 15 people locked in our salon. It was scary. I had a young girl who was actually doing work experience who was having a panic attack. Um, it's not a movie. It's not a game. Uh, these are real people who have now a lasting memory of a you know, terrible sequence of events. As it turns out, having been confronted by a police officer at the front of the bank, the robber flees out the back door, but in his panic to get away, he climbs over the fence and in the process leaves behind some very important clues. One of his first mistakes, um, where he jumped the fence at the rear of the bank into a laneway and cut himself uh, and left considerable amount of blood and physical evidence there. Uh, which is very useful for us. In very simple terms, what we haven't been able to do is match the crime scene evidence with the national database of DNA, and indications would therefore be that he's not on the database, uh, but doesn't mean he won't be. While the police haven't caught their man yet, there is a pattern to the robberies, and it appears he has inside knowledge. One of the theories is that he might have at least a knowledge of how banks or at least the finance sector works. He refers to terms such as treasury or uh, the reserves or talks about the type of uh, drawers that cash might be in, etc. So it's an indication he knows at least something or knows someone in the finance sector or banking sector. Or the security sector? It may well be. We know from the witnesses we've spoken to and some recordings of his voice that he certainly has an Australian accent and we think that's a key to someone knowing something about him. And the bandit has made some mistakes. Police have a tantalising glimpse of his face. We're seeing him walking into the Wollonga Bank in the middle uh, with his hand covering his face. Uh, someone must have seen his face outside, but then we see Yankalilla which is another time where we think there's a bit of a mistake where we've got vision of his face again. You see some very strong male features. He's a, quite a solid fellow with, you know, good-sized wrists and a solid build. Yeah. This is the mistakes that will bring him undone. Mm. After the bandit had another close call at the 10th robbery in 2009, the hold-ups suddenly stopped. In all, he reportedly stole more than a quarter of a million dollars. Why did he stop? One, we hope he has stopped. Two, I hope to ask him that myself one day. But number three, uh, it might be uh, a choice he's made because Balaclava must have uh, scared him. What would you say to anybody who might have a, even a tiniest bit of information? Oh, oh, absolutely, come forward because, you know, these, these people in the bank who are there at the time, they don't deserve that sort of treatment and no one deserves to have a, you know, a firearm or a, or a knife. I think we've just got to really, as a community, stop this sort of stuff happening. Our investigation does not end, will not end, and uh, we will hunt this person forever. Joining us now, the detective heading the hunt for the Hills Bandit, Superintendent Peter Harvey. And, Superintendent, that's a dangerous-looking weapon you've got there, but critical to your investigations. Yes, Neil, it is. It's a uh, critical bit of our investigation, and in this case, particularly so because the butt of the rifle is sawn off to make it more concealable. But, yes, a dangerous-looking weapon. And distinctive? Do you think somebody would recognise it? 
Well, we're hoping someone will. Uh, they are a number of these weapons around, but this one's distinctive in that the butt has been sawn off. So they are uh, distinctive, but not unique. An another piece of evidence on one of the robberies, uh, Detective Superintendent, he wears a bicycle, uh, he wears a motorcycle helmet. Neil, on one of the robberies, a motorcycle helmet was worn. It had uh, some unique markings on it. And uh, that's a critical piece of uh, evidence that we are, uh, are counting on for people to perhaps recognise. And when he's inside the banks, he addresses the male and female staff in a particular way. Tell me about that. Some of the unique language is using the word girly or matey, but uh, by itself not, not be much. But when you put that together with uh, the weapon, the motorcycle helmet and his language, uh, they start to make a compelling case and that's what we're hoping people can join the dots and give us a call. You've said he's a pretty solid looking fellow, but is he maybe deliberately bulking up and could he be wearing, say, a bulletproof vest? There's every chance he could be wearing a vest. He certainly disguises himself. Uh, it may be deliberate. It may be that he is uh, wearing a vest. We just don't know. But he's certainly a large uh, built fellow. And uh, Superintendent, there's a reward, a $100,000 reward for information leading to the, the capture of this bandit. What would you say to anybody who may even have just uh, the smallest snippet of information? Yes, there is a $100,000 reward and it's those small bits of information that by themselves are just interesting. But when you put them together, they are compelling, as I said. So we'd ask you to think about it. If you know something, then please call the police or Crime Stoppers. Superintendent Peter Harvey, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Neil. And here's that Crime Stoppers number again. If you can help police, one 800 33 000. Or you can report crime online at the Crime Stoppers website. Now to Matt Doran with details on how you've already helped police with some important leads on the cases in last week's program. Sandra, the response has been incredible. There was a massive 700% increase in calls to Crime Stoppers last week, and they've given police some crucial new information. On the 2009 shooting murder of Shane Barker in Campbelltown, Northern Tasmania, detectives are now following up good leads that you've provided on a Toyota, Toyota Hilux caught on camera near the murder scene. Now, it's believed the driver may have had an argument with Shane on the morning of the murder, and police may now be edging closer to discovering who that was. Your calls have also provided Homicide Squad detectives with new hope in their efforts to identify Angel, a young woman whose remains were found in the notorious Belangelo State Forest. There have been almost 50 calls from all over the country, and the officer in charge of the case says they are actively pursuing six solid leads. And good news too, in fact, tremendous news on the search for missing teenager Bethany Neville. The now 14-year-old was last seen at Sydney's Central Station four months ago. Now, to bring us up to date, Sandra is with Bethany's mother, Tracy, and the detective in charge of the case, Sergeant Paul Connery. Tracy and Paul, thanks for joining us. Paul, if I could ask you, some pivotal calls as a direct result of the show last week. Yeah, as a direct um, result from the show last week, we've had two pieces of information. One in particular was a phone call from a person claiming to be Bethany, uh, and we would like for Bethany to call us back again at Crime Stoppers. There were two calls, though, both similar? Yes, both similar. Tracy, how did you feel when you got the call from Paul? Um, Paul rang me and being honest, um, after I hung up the phone, I just cried for an hour, trying to get my head around it. And then after that, I'm just trying not to get my hopes up too high, but I am I feel good about it. It's, it's the most positive response that we've had so far. It sure is. Paul, any idea where she is? Uh, we do have some ideas, yes. Yeah, she's, um, we believe to be safe. Mm -hmm. We do have a good idea where she is. That's such important news for you, for you, Tracy. It's been four months of not knowing, hasn't it? Yeah, four long months. We've had her birthday and Mother's Day and all these things in between. Any idea now as to what might have triggered her disappearance? Still not 100% sure why. I'm not sure, like, what she's thinking, trying to rack my brain about why. Um, I know, you know, similar things, a bit of bullying at school, wanted to go to Sydney, um, not happy with a few areas in her life and things. And I think she's just made that decision on the spur of the moment and then just kept following it through and the ball's rolled down and it's, the time's getting longer and she's just too scared to come back and face what's happened.
Paul, what do you need those people who made the calls to do now? Well, especially the one who um, claimed to be Bethany. We need Bethany to call Crime Stoppers again. And what about you, Tracy? If Bethany's watching tonight, what's your message to her? OK, Beth, if you're watching and it was you that rang, you need to ring again so that they can verify that it's you. Um, you know what to do. You know what's the right thing. Please just say me and your brother and everyone else that's really sad and upset just to verify that you're, you are safe and it is you. Um, it's not about coming home. It's just about being safe and they need to verify it's you and not somebody else. You need to know. Tracy Marnie, thanks for your time. Detective Sergeant Paul Connery, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's hope there is more good news on the Bethany case in the days ahead. And remember, if you have any additional information, Crime Stoppers is the place to go. Next, on Wanted, exclusive security vision of a credit card scammer in action. Help us track down this man before he strikes again. And our forensic expert, Dr Xanthi Mallet, reveals new evidence that could help crack a 42-year-old cold case murder. She was a wonderful person, full of life. Nothing seemed to scare her. She just had this presence about her. You're watching Wanted, the show where police need your help solving crimes. And a reminder, if you have any information on the Adelaide Hills Bank robber or more on the whereabouts of Bethany Neville, the Crime Stoppers number is on the screen and Crime Stopper operators are standing by right now. And of course, you can also report crime online to Crime Stoppers anonymously if you wish. Here's another appeal, this time from our crime-busting former detective superintendent, Terry Dalton. And it's a scam that could be costing you money. Terry. We all know credit card companies want you to use your card as much as possible. And today, it's even easier to pay. Just tap and go. But in the wrong hands, you can wave goodbye to your cash. Victoria Police are keen to speak with this person, caught on CCTV using a stolen credit card. On April the 20th this year, he went on a tap-and-go crime spree in the Melbourne suburb of Preston. He swiped the stolen card 22 times at 12 different stores in the Northland Shopping Centre. Here, he buys cigarettes, and when he finds they total less than the transaction limit of $100, he buys even more. Police believe these three other people, seen on CCTV, may know the person of interest and could help with his identification. Take a close look. You know the drill? Get on to Crime Stoppers. Your call could be the lead we need. Now, another case where we need your help. University is all about getting an education, but sometimes there may be characters studying a different kind of degree. Police want to talk with these three people seen at Melbourne University. They may be able to help with their inquiries over a series of stolen laptops and smartphones totaling more than $30,000. Remember always, keep an eye on your valuables no matter where you are. There are far too many people these days studying the art of stealing right around the country. So if you recognise any of those faces, here's the Crime Stoppers number again, one 800 triple zero, And make sure you keep up with all our news on Twitter at WantedTVHQ and join the conversation, hashtag WantedTV. Now to our forensic scientist, Dr Xanthi Mallet, and a brutal case of murder, Xanthi. Thanks, Sandra. The savage murder of 82-year-old Katie Page shocked when, people, when it happened more than 40 years ago. And tonight, it will shock people again. Everyone who knew Katie loved her. She was a model citizen. No one had a bad word to say against her. So why was she killed? And who killed her? Tonight, I can reveal new evidence that could answer both questions but only with your help. She was a wonderful person, full of life, and joked with everybody, and she took as much as she gave. She was very determined. She was resilient. Nothing seemed to scare her. She'd stand up. She just had this presence about her. Katie Page lived in Canamble, in the west of New South Wales. It's a quiet town where the only thing louder than the galahs are the church bells. Rewind to 1971. Katie is one of Canamble's most loved residents and answers the call of those church bells more than most. 
She was a Catholic and she was um, very, very strong in the church. Longtime local Bill Shanahan remembers the last time he saw his friend. It was just one day before Katie was killed. And of course, no one had to guess where she was going. She was going to Mass, of course. And anyway, I went down and turned around and picked her up and took her to, uh, to the church and let her out. And I said to her, don't forget, this will cost you a prayer. And showing her wit, she said, don't worry, darling, I pray for all, for all the sinners. But on the 4th of February, 1971, a sinner took Katie's life. On that day, Katie gets ready to go to the shops. She's picking up a prescription and buying the papers for an elderly friend. She heads outside. Another lady was walking past at 1.30 and had seen Kate talking to an unknown person at the front door. That is probably the last person who's seen Kate alive. To this day, no one knows who that person is. It's never come forward. Cold case detective Jason Darcy believes that while Katie is out, an intruder enters her house. Kate has started off into town and turned back and basically confronted this person. It's a very callous crime, you know. Kate was a 82-year-old lady, you know, she's basically helpless. The following morning, another lady's called in to see Kate knocked on the door. Kate! There was no answer. She's seen that the mail was still in the mailbox. Kate? Another lady was walking Kate? past. I think something's wrong with Kate. They've gone around, okay. they've looked through the window. Oh, oh. Careful! Yeah. Another of Katie's friends was walking by at the time. Ray Adams, then 24. Grace and Mary saw me on the road. Oh, excuse me! Excuse me! Come. Yes, yes. No, it's our friend. And they asked me if I'd go and climb in the window because they thought Kate had had a heart attack. Can you see? I can see her. We climbed inside. I saw Kate lying face down. A lot of blood. day in February 1971 when the body of 82 year old Katie Page was found it was a crime that shocked and mystified the local community and that's because the normally placid Castle Ray River had burst its banks the town is cut off and all the roads are flooded so nobody is leaving town not even the murderer they basically put a net over the township of Canamble Canamble's 3,000 residents including the killer are trapped in town but police don't catch the culprit. What they do find outside Katie's house, hidden under a drum, is her handbag. There's no conclusive fingerprint evidence, and back then, no DNA samples were taken. I believe this person was, uh, was looking for money. He was a, a thief. Robbery gone wrong. Robbery gone wrong, yeah. On an 82-year-old old lady. I think he's panicked. He's uh, in fear of being identified, and that's why he's struck, struck Kate. But the killer leaves behind a significant clue. Imprints from the butt of the murder weapon, a Spanish-made shotgun. The person would have had it concealed, because it would have obviously stuck out someone walking down the street, unless it was wrapped up in a, a duffel bag or in a coat or something. To this day, the gun has never been found but we can show you exactly what it looks like. Mark Horder explains how ballistics experts at the time identified the type of gun that was used. As we can see on this photo, you've got a build-up of blood from the screw, so it'd be the location of the screw, the shape of the, the actual pad, and also it looks like there was some sort of emblem. That emblem will often have the manufacturer of the firearm actually um, embossed into the pad itself. So the striations on the dress are actually from this shoulder pad here? That's correct. It's quite consistent with, with this type of pad. And they basically made inquiries around Australia to identify owners of these Spanish Garana shotguns. 
Unfortunately, back in those days, the gun laws weren't as stringent as they are now, and, and people weren't required to register each firearm. Police in Canamble continue to investigate, but the case goes cold. And the town struggles to cope. They were started locking their doors and they were looking at people differently, even strangers, you know. Everyone got scared. It's just sent a shiver through the whole town and that sort of lasted for, for years. It's just like a big ripple effect through the whole town. It's 42 years since Ray Adams found Katie's body, but that terrible day has left a scar. Yeah, it still think, brings back that memory because I can still see Kate laying on the floor in the pool of blood with the gash in the back of her head. She always featured in my life. This blanket is 60 years old. <laughs> and it was given to me by Kate. And I have treasured it all my life. And that's why I wanted it here today. I just hope they catch the mongrel. It is an absolutely harrowing story, but hopefully we have some new information that we're actually presenting this evening that's going to help us with that. So this is new evidence? Yep, never been seen before. So these are actually replicas um, of some of the items we believe may have been Katie's, and they're both personal items, religious items. This first one here is a scapula, so this would have been worn around the neck. She was a very devout Catholic. So this is one of the items that we're hoping people are going to be recognising this evening. And the second is actually a crucifix. And the importance of these is they've been handed in fairly recently, but we're very much hoping that somebody can link those to Katie this evening. How unusual is that, Xanthi? Because as you know, this has been more than four decades that this case has been ongoing, uh, and new evidence has surfaced. Quite extraordinary. Why is this information now so critical? And this could really be the key to this case. That's why it's so important that somebody may recognise these items, may know where they've been for the last mm. 40 years, handed in a couple of years ago. So these could absolutely help solve this case. Let's hope so. What can you tell us in terms of these items in an evidentiary sense? Have they, I assume they have been absolutely forensically tested in every sense? They have. They've been tested. They've been even sent to the US to have DNA analysis done on them. But unfortunately, because they've not been stored appropriately for the last 40 years, it's degraded and we didn't get full profiles. Just with the passage of time. It's not a lot you can do. So I guess, Xanthi, that makes it even more important, does it, that uh, because there's not that scientific link there now with this new evidence, that if anyone recognises these items, this new evidence, that they come forward to police? That's what the police really need in this case. They have to link these to Katie. So if somebody knows where they've been for 40 years or they know that these are Katie's, please come forward. Let's hope so, because that could provide the, the crucial final link to bringing uh, Katie Page's family peace. Thanks very much, Xanthi. Thanks, guys. Stay with us on Wanted. Next, exclusive security vision of two thieves responsible for a string of audacious break-ins. You'll be very surprised at what they're stealing. They obviously have some knowledge of what they're doing. These criminals are shopping to order. now of exactly where we need your help tonight. This man is wanted in South Australia over at least 10 armed bank hold-ups. And here are the key clues to his identity. At one bank, he slips up and reveals his face before pulling his balaclava down. This shot shows his false moustache, but a very real nose. Here's the SKK assault rifle that he uses with the butt sawn off. He also commonly refers to women as girly. Now, if you recognise him and perhaps he's been spending up big, then get on to Crime Stoppers. Melbourne detectives want to talk to this man over a stolen credit card scam. He was caught on camera at the Northland Shopping Centre in Preston. Police also believe these other three people seen with him may be able to help them with their inquiries. And our forensic scientist, Dr Xanthi Mallet, has revealed some new evidence in the hunt for the killer of 82-year-old Katie Page at Canamble in country New South Wales. This scapula with Our Lady of Mount Carmel on it, along with this crucifix, provides some fresh new leads. If we can prove they belong to Katie, 
police may have their best lead on the murderer. So please contact Crime Stoppers if you have any information on that or the other stories. They're standing by across Australia right now. That number again, 1800 333 000, or you can go online at the Crime Stoppers website. And remember, you can report information anonymously. Matt? Thanks, Sandra. Well, now to another story from our crime-busting retired detective superintendent, Terry Dalton. He's got exclusive security vision from a series of audacious Sydney robberies, and he needs your help catching the culprits. They're lightning fast and well organised. They leave few clues. These two crooks are causing mayhem in post offices across Sydney, but they're after an unlikely target. In all my years as a police officer, and some time spent as a postal investigator, I haven't come across a crime like this, where stamps have been targeted, from these regular postage stamps to collector's editions. These crooks have really done their homework. During the past three months, the stamp bandits have hit 11 post offices. The MO is always the same. The thieves gain access to the premises in the dark of night and force entry. Once inside, they move quickly. They're not interested in anything else. They go straight for the stamps and commemorative coins. They're only spending a short period of time in there. They are covering themselves and their faces and wearing gloves. Detective Chief Inspector Stuart Bell is leading the investigation. It's interesting that they're stealing stamps, which when you look at it, is another form of currency. They are, they actually have the face value of the stamp is what the stamp is worth. Uh, to date, they've stolen about $148,000 worth of stamps. On every job, the stamp bandits seem to know not only where the stamps are, but where the security cameras are. They obviously have some knowledge of what they're doing. These criminals are shopping to order. They obviously have an outlet for them. There is so little known about the, uh, the stamp industry from our policing perspective that it's been difficult to locate where the stamps are going. On the 18th of May, the stamp bandits go on their most ambitious crime spree. They knock over four post offices in just two hours. Ataman is first at midnight. Just 40 minutes later, they hit Dremoyne. As usual, they break in through the back door. On this occasion, they go straight to the storeroom. The thieves rip this door off its hinges. They've gained access to the storage room where you have a number of compartments where floats and stamps were kept. You can see where they've jimmied open each individual storage area to gain access and steal the contents. They weren't finished yet. In minutes, they rifle through every drawer, cupboard, safe. The Dremoyne Post Office is cleaned out of every single stamp. They even nicked the 10 cent ones. Soon after, they hit Annandale Post Office at 1.18 a.m. An hour later, they hit St Peter's. CCTV shows them follow their usual pattern. But this time, no stamps. They head to the storeroom. Again, no stamps. It's not going to plan. But our normally camera shy crooks don't want to leave empty handed. They grab what they can and finally offer up the smallest of clues to their identity. Take a look. First, one bloke looks at the camera. Then, there's a profile shot of his mate. And here's another look at the first crook. Resorting to sterling electronics, they use a post office bag to bundle them up. I wonder whether they leave their bedrooms as messy as this. We would hope that someone might recognise their build, their height, the eyes of the people. And if they do, please contact Crime Stoppers. Let's help police lick the stamp bandits. Now, Terry, quite a fascinating story. As a former postal investigator yourself, I imagine you've seen all manner of scams, but even still, this is an unusual loot. What, why postage stamps? Absolutely, Matt. I think with postage stamps, they have a face value, and people take them for granted. These guys have stolen quite a few of them, you know, $150,000 worth, and stamps, when we look at them, aren't easily identifiable mm. other than the face value, and they're like a currency. Obviously really difficult to trace. What about then, Terry, in terms of trying to move them on? Uh, is there a market for this sort of product? Well, what we think, and I've spoken to the police about it, and 
the best thing we can come up with as far as that's concerned is that these stamps are probably being on sold through convenience stores, perhaps news agencies, even service stations, where people would go about their own business and buying stamps, mm. not knowing that they're actually stolen. So what's your message then, Terry, to anyone who might come into contact with these criminals who are trying to offload these stamps? Well, the message is don't buy them. Mm. You're receiving stolen property and you could be charged yourself with receiving the stolen property. If you see somebody who's trying to off-sell these stamps, you're offered the stamps, call Crime Stoppers and, and get them off the streets. Sage advice indeed. Thanks very much, Terry. Thanks, Matt. All right, well, stay with us. Among the stories coming up on Wanted, a desperate appeal from a mother to her son who's now been missing for more than a year. Please let us know how you are. We just want to know that you're OK. Time now to update another of our stories from last week. And this was a particularly violent hold-up in the Perth suburb of Cadinia. The robber bashes the shop attendant with a steel bar. He hits him a number of times and then gets away with just a handful of cash. This is a close-up of his face and his clothes. And thanks to your help, Western Australia Police have a few leads on just who he might be. But they're hoping viewers watching tonight can provide more information. So, for the latest, we're joined by our Perth crime correspondent, Nick Way. Nick? Yes, Sandra. This was such a vicious attack that police remain extremely concerned about it. The good news is that, thanks to wanted viewers calling in in the last week, they have got a couple of more leads on that, and they're following up those uh, pieces of information. We can't tell you exactly what, because it's an ongoing investigation. And just while I'm on that, I've just heard from Crime Stoppers nationally that just during tonight's program, there's been a six-fold increase in calls to, uh, to Crime Stoppers. So fantastic work, uh, viewers, but keep up the good work. And as I was saying, WA police really do need your help on this particularly vicious attack. So we're appealing to anyone who knows anything. If you were down around that Cadinia shop uh, about three weeks ago, the 26th of June, 1 o'clock in the morning, if you saw anything suspicious or you know this man, he's aged about 30 to 35, of Asian descent, about 165 centimetres tall. Now, his victim was injured in this attack. They had to be, he had to be treated at Fremantle Hospital. So police need to get this man off the streets before he attacks again. They Sandra. do indeed. They do indeed. Thank you, Nick Way, with an update there on that rather violent bashing in Perth, in fact, in Cadinia. Matt? Thanks, Sandra. You're watching Wanted, and remember, if you can help with any of our cases tonight, 1800 333 000, that is the Crime Stoppers number, and keep that number in mind as Terry Dalton introduces us to more of tonight's Most Wanted. Right from the start, let me tell you, don't try approaching any of these blokes we're about to meet. They could be extremely dangerous. This is Brady Hamilton. He's one of New South Wales' most wanted. There's a warrant out for his arrest over a bashing murder in Erskine Park in Sydney 14 years ago. One of his many distinguishing features is a heavily tattooed chest. Now, Steve William Allen, wanted in connection with an aggravated burglary at Tullamarine in Melbourne just last month, and he may be living in the Williamstown area. Finally, Brendan Kirkwood, a warrant's out for his arrest over an aggravated burglary involving a firearm at Tutgarook in Victoria three years ago. He may have fled to Queensland's Sunshine Coast or further north around Cairns. As I said before, don't try to be a hero. If you reckon you know any of those fellows, get straight on the Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Now to another person we're hoping you can help find and end the heartbreak for a mother in Perth. Someone is reported missing in Australia every 18 minutes. And although 95% are found on returning home relatively quickly, at least 1,800 people in Australia have been missing for more than six months. One such person is 44-year-old Matt Frodsham. Now, his family hasn't heard from Matt since he left home in Western Australia and travelled to the Gladstone area in Queensland looking for work. That was one year ago. I spoke with Matt's mother, Margaret, earlier tonight. Margaret, thanks for joining us. Tell me, how have you coped for 12 months or more not hearing from him? It's been very difficult because I miss him a lot. I used to see him every day and I think about him every day. 
and I would really love to see him again. Was he experiencing any problems that you can tell us about? Oh, he had some business challenges here in WA and he thought he'd like to go to Queensland and make a new life in Queensland and visit his father in Brisbane. Now, there's been some confirmed sightings last July, but nothing since. What are your worst fears? Oh, my worst fears are that he has disappeared. But I'm keeping a very positive attitude and I think that he has started a new life for himself and that everything is well with him. Let's hope so. Is he the type of person that's quite jovial, outgoing and gets on well with people? Yes, definitely. He was very outgoing and got on well with people, definitely. So, Margaret, if Matt's watching tonight, what would be your appeal to him? I would say, please let us know how you are. We just want to know that you're OK. I'm quite happy with you making a new life in Queensland. That's all right with us. But I just want to know that you're well and that you're OK. Thanks for joining us. We do hope, with everyone's help, you can get some good news here on that. Thank you very much, Sandra. You're watching Wanted. We'll be back with more in a moment. Now a recap on the help police need for tonight's cases. Contact Crime Stoppers if you can help track down this man. He's wanted over at least 10 armed bank hold-ups in the Adelaide Hills, netting a quarter of a million dollars. The best leads to his identity are the type of rifle he uses, these images of his face, and the fact he uses the term girly when threatening female staff. Look at this scapula and crucifix. They are fresh evidence which could help solve the cold case murder of 82-year-old Katie Page. Do you recognise them? Detectives suspect they belong to Katie and could lead to the killer. And do you know these bandits? They've been robbing post offices across Sydney for the past three months and have got away with almost $150,000 worth of stamps. And what about this man, who police in Melbourne want to talk to about a credit card scam at a Preston shopping centre? They also want to speak with these three people who may know the person of interest. That Crime Stoppers number again is 1800 333 000, and you can also report crime online via the Crime Stoppers website. Remember, your information is vital and can be reported anonymously. Now, a big thank you to all the viewers who have joined the conversation on Twitter tonight. There's been a great response, especially to our story on missing 14-year-old Bethany. Lauren tweets that Bethany's mum is so brave and she hopes Beth makes the call. We do too. And on the Katie Page murder, there is a heart and soul behind every victim. A family torn apart and lives destroyed. If you can help, do so and pick up the phone. Make sure you get all our Wanted updates via Twitter at WantedTVHQ and join the conversation hashtag WantedTV. If you'd like to catch up with any of our cases, go to the Wanted TV website. Next week on Wanted, our investigation into the father of two who left his family after falling in love with a prostitute and then went to extreme ends to spoil his new lover. After faking his own death, he's now wanted for armed robbery. He's on the run and extremely dangerous. He opened the door if you were walking past and the door needed to be opened. He was very quiet, always nicely dressed. And I was completely blown away when I found out that he was a bank robber. And that's about it for Wanted Tonight. On behalf of all the team, Xanthi, Matt, Terry and Neil, have a good night. And remember, keeping our community safe is everyone's responsibility. Evidence is everywhere. If you see something, say something. Good night.